So, sketch the graph of this parabola showing all important features. Ta-da, there it is. Now, just a quick note for you, right? You have to think carefully when you're starting to graph things now because as you look at this, you see all of those parts. You're like, oh, I have to do lots of stuff with this graph afterwards, right? So you cannot make this like a, sometimes I talk about the fact that draw a quick and dirty graph just so you can see what's going on, right? But this is not a quick and dirty graph. This is a graph that you can see from the question they want us to do lots of things with, okay? So you have to do this one quite carefully. Uh, in most cases, it doesn't really matter if your horizontal and vertical scales are inconsistent. But in this case, when you are graphing the inverse on the same graph, it causes you a lot of problems if your scale is off. So it's in your interest. It's a simple shape. So invest in it a little bit to make it accurate. You can see I've got my vertex, my intercepts all there. That's my parabola. That's part one, okay? Part two, find the largest domain containing x equals zero for which the inverse function exists. So you can see I've highlighted this in blue over here. Um, this has a stationary point in it. So I know I have to restrict the domain in some way. I can only pick one half or the other in order to get an inverse function out of this. So why have I chosen the left-hand side rather than the right-hand side? Left-hand side, have a look. There's something in the question, see? Yeah, no? I th look, look at the question. The question doesn't give you that much information. What does it tell you? This is part two. Find the largest domain. Yeah, thank you, Dominic. So containing x equals zero, here's x equals zero in here. So I need this part of the graph, which means you must have this left-hand part, okay? If you use the right-hand part, you're going to, you know, you're going to have an inverse relation. It won't work, you've got to double up, okay? So we've got that. State the domain and range of the inverse function. Um, let me show you how I did it. By far the easiest way was to work out the domain and range of your original function, right? And then for the domain and range of your inverses, you just swap everything around, okay? So you had just worked out the original domain, so that will become your range. Where have I put it? Down here? Yep. Um, but you haven't worked out range yet, so you can see, here's my vertex down here. The range of the original parabola is y is greater than or equal to negative 4. So therefore, when you go to your domain for your inverse, it's x is greater than negative 4. So it's just a straight swap, okay? Now, then you have to, and this is, <laughs> oh, we tried, we tried. But our graphs really struggled on this. Uh, it was just a simple parabola, but you had to get them looking right at the same time. So what does the graph look like on the same set of axes? Um, you needed to read ahead in the question to know you were going to do that in order to have sort of the right amount of the coordinate axes there. Some of you kind of tried to extend your set of axes a little bit, but it ended up going a bit pear-shaped. So you can see, if you turn your head, turn your head 45 degrees, can you do it? Can you see if you look along, I'll draw it in there for you. If you look along this here, right, um, you can see the axis of symmetry. In fact, sorry, why am I asking you to turn your head? I can do better than that. Here we go, zoop. Ta-da, there's 45 degrees. So can you see, can you see here's the symmetry matching up to this shape, which is the part that we restricted to, okay? So you obviously can just turn your page to do that, but that's how you will know you've got your shape basically right. It's quite hard to see if your um, axes are not equal to each other, if your, if your scales are not equal to each other. So when you're dealing with inverses, um, just be careful, it's really helpful to have a consistent scale, okay? Uh, and then lastly, you had to find the equation of the inverse. So here it is. Now, how did you go about doing it, I wonder? Uh, this, this seemed like the most straightforward way to me, so I wanted to complete the square. Um, some of you did this marvelously, like it was textbook. Thumbs up. Okay, I think Kai's from memory is really good. Good job, Kai. Uh, you can see, when you get to this point here, you've completed the square, but you're trying to make y the subject, aren't you? So you take the square to both sides, but there's a plus minus. Why is there a plus minus in my working here? Think about what the algebra means. What shape is this from? It's from a parabola. It had two parts to it, right? The plus and the minus refer to there's a plus, there's an upper half, and there's a minus, a lower half. Just like if you're doing a semicircle, there's a top semicircle, bottom semicircle, okay? Um, the best answers said, well, actually, I only want one of them. And there's a reason why, because in an earlier part of the question, I stated the domain restriction, right? So you want the part that's underneath one, so that's why you have to take the negative case, okay? All right, now, um, 
There was a lot in part B. Does anyone have any questions about that one? Part B. Just crying? That's okay. All right, let's have a look. Let's move on to... Um, I'm going to skip over uh, C and D because I thought they were done overall pretty well. The small number of you, if you had issues with it, you can come and ask Mrs. Lee and I afterwards. I want to go straight on to E. Now, uh, some of you, a small number of you, panicked, ran out of time. You're like, ooh, it says find value. I have a calculator. And you reach for your calculator and your calculator can do this for you, right? Of course, if you just use your calculator, have a look at the question, what's it worth? It's worth... Two. So you'll get one, like that's better than nothing if the bell's about to go, but how do you actually get the full marks for this, okay? Let's have a look at the way I set this out. I'm just going to put this right off the bat. For two marks, this is more than what you need for two marks. I'll point to the exact bits that are important. But I've put all of this here so you understand the thought process underneath what's going on. If I were doing this, this in an exam, probably everything from above here I would be doing in my head, okay? But if you can't do it in your head, this is what it should look like, right? You've got a sine inverse of negative 4 on 5, that's an angle of some kind. And you have a cos inverse of 8 on 17, that's another angle of some kind. So in order to make the latter parts of this easier, I've just given them names. Theta, phi, alpha, beta, whatever you want. Okay? Now, first thing to note, there are restrictions on what theta can be and, uh, and phi can be, whatever these angles are, based on the inverse trig functions that are being used. Okay? So do you notice here, I immediately, without even thinking, I look and I say, ooh, sine inverse. There's a restriction on that. It can only possibly be between negative pi on 2 and pi on 2. Does that make sense? So I know that right out the gate before I even start drawing any triangles. In the same way, cos inverse has a restriction on it, but it's a different one. You remember that? Think back to your inverse trig graphs. It's, um, it's this one, it goes whoop, like that, and it lands on the x-axis. So it goes from naught to pi. So there's a restriction on this angle as well. Now I say negative 4 on 5, 8 on 17, these are sides in right angled triangles. Now a significant number of you, it's quite common, will draw a triangle, oops, sorry, will draw a triangle like this. Uh, theta, what did I just say? 4, 5, 3. Okay? Now, there's nothing wrong with drawing a triangle like this. You can still get the answer out of it, okay? But I want you to have a look at this purple triangle and tell, you tell me what information is there in my diagram, the one I've drawn, versus this purple one that is lost when you just draw a triangle like this. It's the negative. And that turns out, zoop, that turns out to be kind of really important, right? Um, it's tricky with a question like this because if you try the positive value, it looks like you get a sensible answer down the bottom. And you're like, I don't know what tan inverse of blah, blah, blah is, you know, it seems okay to me. But you have to be careful. So I would encourage you to draw this within the context of the quadrants, right? Negative pi on 2 to pi on 2 means you're in quadrant 4, quadrant 1. This guy over here could be quadrant 1, quadrant 2. But then you can say, oh wait, but sine is negative. So that's the fourth quadrant, not the first. Oh wait, cos is positive. That can't be the second quadrant. It must be the first. Does that make sense? So from there you then can infer your values for tan of each of those angles by reading off the triangles. Um, this guy is a fourth quadrant angle, tan is negative in the fourth quadrant. This phi is in the first quadrant, so everything's positive, that's why I have 15 on 8, not negative 15 on 8. Okay? Alright, um, question? No, to not put cos in the fourth quadrant since it's positive. Yep, okay, so, good question. Cos ASTC can be positive in quadrant 1 and in quadrant 4. But the piece of information I know that tells me I can't be in quadrant 4 is because cos inverse doesn't reach quadrant 4, right? So it comes in before I think about the 8 on 17. It comes from this guy. Because think about what cos inverse looks like. Uh, there it is, right? So that's pi on 2 there, right? So this is quadrant 1 from naught to pi on 2 and then this is quadrant 2 from pi on 2 to pi but then cos inverse doesn't exist anywhere else um, cos sorry uh, quadrant 4 would be down here right um, negative pi on 2 to 0 that would be quadrant 4 which of course sine inverse can go into because we know its shape is different uh, it looks like this right Oop. Like so, okay? So here is quadrant one up here, and here is quadrant four down here. Um, negative pi on two to zero, zero to pi on two. Is that okay? Yeah. It's quite tricky. 
It, it's especially weird when you see me shading, you're like, what do you mean? That's a quadrant. That doesn't look like a quadrant. We're thinking about the angles that correspond to that. Okay. Okay, um, I will skip over F and G because I think they were okay. I mean, they're quite, they're quite brief questions. You can have a look at my answer if you like. Um, I will just point out it's way easier to differentiate if you use your log laws first. We've seen this many times, right? If you have to differentiate or integrate, please simplify first. You can do this with chain rule and get your answer out. I mean, you have to use chain rule anyway. You can use chain rule twice if you want, but it's just less error prone if you use it just once. Okay. Uh, last one. Here is the final question. Huzzah. Okay. Um, part one. They give you this weird, awkward thing. They say differentiate, right? Part two, they then say, hey, find an area, which means integrate. So this is one of those differentiate, hence integrate questions. The derivative turns out, oh, how conveniently simple, tan inverse of x, which of course is what you have to integrate in the very next part. Okay, so there's what I'm going to come up with because I'm just reversing the process I had in part one. And then you just have to be careful and judicious in your substitution of um, boundaries into this. Uh, common errors, you know, log of zero, uh, log of one rather, that's zero. Okay, so that's why this all just comes out in the wash. Uh, a few people left it as half log four. I don't think many, but some people left it. We know log laws for this. That's um, log of the square root of four, so you can simplify that. And there is your area. And in this case, Declan would be right in putting unit squared here because they were asking for an area. Okay. <laughs>